Hi everyone, welcome back to See the Invisible, Living with an Invisible or Rare Disease. My name is Rhonda Franny Jefferson, and thank you so much for taking some time out to listen today. If you're new to this podcast, welcome. To give you a little bit of information about myself and why I'm doing this podcast or video if you're watching from YouTube, I do have an invisible and a rare illness. And, you know, just every day I do face challenges, but especially this past year has been difficult, um, even more so. And I faced both enormous amounts of support, but then also the exact opposite and have received ridicule and backlash. And I felt that if I was experiencing that, there had to be some others who you know, we're maybe not experiencing the exact same thing, but probably something similar. So I wanted to put my energy into doing something productive and positive. So, you know, I decided to start this podcast to, you know, try to lend a voice, um, spread encouragement and share some of my experiences. Um, I also do have a son on the autism spectrum and Actually, while I was recording um, a little bit earlier, I um, started to think that I, I found my voice when I was trying to get him some support um, through this pandemic and with some of his educational needs. And I found that you know when I'm fighting for other people, I tend to have a stronger voice. So I just kind of took that and said, you know what, you know, I, I think I need to do this for me too, because it's very therapeutic for me. Um, so I just really appreciate, you know, this opportunity to be able to share, you know, just my experiences and um, I really just hope everybody gets even just a little something out of it. Um, and before I do start into the podcast, I always just want to mention that I am in no way a medical, insurance, or legal expert. So please make sure that if you, know, you do have a question in those specific areas that you are reaching out to the appropriate people or experts. Um, now to summarize, um, you know, we, we've been going over some of the comparisons between the um, influenza from 1918 to the current pandemic. Um, and in previous episodes, I did mention vaccines and we went a little bit over that. Um, I do have an appointment with a doctor next week to see if I should get the vaccine. I have a lot of allergies along with my illness. And so my um, one specialist really thought I needed to see an immunologist first, um, who is um, an allergist as well. I did have some appointments this week, this past week, and actually a dentist appointment today, um, the 22nd. And, you know, this, the appointment I had last week, I know that not every doctor is really familiar with what I have. And I mean, even going back a few years ago, I went to immediate care for, um, I think it was strep throat at the time. And you know, when I went in there, the doctor was there and she had two students shadowing her that were studying to be physician's assistants. And, you know, sometimes, you know, even though the strep throat was not, um, you know, really related to my illness, it's important that doctors or medical professionals understand that I have it and how I'm being treated with the different medications that I'm on. And so, um, I told her what I had and she asked her students if they'd ever heard of it. They hadn't. And so she comes back and says, well, I Googled it. And so all three of them were Googling and getting information about my illness. So I'm just like, I, I just need some antibiotics at this point, please. But um, so I kind of approach new doctors with, you know, with the respect that they deserve because they have gone through medical school. They went through more training than I could ever imagine. But I also know there are hundreds of thousands of facts that they need to keep straight. So I try to ask upfront, you know, they're familiar with Still's disease. And so 
this past week, the doctor said yes. And so I felt pretty comfortable and some aspects of Stills disease, um, it's auto-inflammatory like rheumatoid arthritis. So we were, were having a conversation and you know, he's asking what my typical day is like. And I explained that I usually have the rheumatoid arthritis um, symptoms throughout the day. And, you know, he's already said that he is familiar with Stills disease, but we get further on in the conversation and he says, okay, so when were you diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis? And it was just kind of like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I've been telling him about my typical day and he's not really understanding what my illness is like. Now, today I had an appointment with the dentist because both my illness can start to affect um, my teeth as well as my jaw. And also the medications can give me dry mouth. And I had to go to a new dentist because my old one stopped accepting um, the dental insurance um, and they were doing it at a higher rate. So I saw the new dentist and I mean, they were very, very thorough. Um, they may not have been familiar with my exact disease, but they had questions. You know, you can tell that they really knew what they were doing because they had some questions prepared um, after they looked at my x-rays and looked at my questionnaire. So, you know, whereas the, the doctor I saw last week, it was a consultation and I understand that he's not a special specialist in the field that um, you know, my disease is in, but it was just kind of disheartening after having this conversation and then into the conversation, it's realized he doesn't really understand um, what my illness is. So um, just kind of taking strides. Um, you know, if you are new here, I've mentioned before that um, there was no FDA approved treatment for my illness until last year. So um, it was encouraging to get the FDA approved treatment, but it doesn't you know, impact everybody the same way. So I'm just hopeful that you know, more awareness will be spread once we get over or as much over the pandemic as we can. Um, you're not really knowing what the future holds with that, but, you know, hoping that things just continue to improve. I also do find that when I go to a doctor or just go out in general in public, I tend to talk a lot to um, anybody that I come in contact with. So I think I was you're talking off the ear of the dental hygienist and the person doing the x-rays because you know, other than my husband and my kids and the cat, you know, I carry on full conversations with the cat and <laughs> that, um, you know, that's really the interaction that I have. So it, you know, it's kind of a breath of fresh air really to get out and, um, you know, talk to someone new. So to proceed with, um, part four of the podcast comparing the 1918 pandemic and the current one. And I promise it will be the last one, even if this goes 45 minutes. Um, we kind of ended with the fact that not everybody will necessarily have the same access to some of the technological advances that we have, such as, um, you know, if you're on a shared data plan with your cell phone um, or don't have high-speed internet, it was more difficult to have your kids attend classes virtually because you, you didn't have the resources. And I know I found myself in that position with you know, trying to be able to afford everything that you know, I needed to make sure that they were in class. Um, I'm sorry, in class. And you know, we're getting everything that they needed and then also knowing that not everybody previously had a computer or a smart device to be able to keep in constant contact. So um, you know, that's where we, we ended with not everybody had the same access. Also with discussing that you know, not everybody you know, can use the same resources the same way that other people can. So if someone has a hearing impairment or a sight impairment, then it can become more difficult to use certain services. Now, currently my, my eyesight is average. I have had to have some operations on my eyes, um, but 
you know, at times, depending on the glare and the size of the writing, I find it difficult to read things. Um, so I know there's going to come a time where it's a lot worse. And so knowing that there are things such as the ADA compliance or the Americans with Disabilities Act compliance for websites to keep them um, accessible to everybody who may need what, what's considered really a non-standard form. But I'm glad that we recognize as a society that we need to have um, different accommodations for people who need those accommodations. Whereas in 1918, you know, there was not really a recognition of those needs unless you were living it or a loved one was living it. So, um, you know, at the beginning when there were daily press conferences, I don't believe that there was a sign language um, person there signing, um, at least not at every conference. So it was a recognition as a society that there did need to be someone there signing and that happened very early on. So I'm very thankful for those recognitions. So how did I utilize some of the technology that we had today that I know would have just been, you know, a, not even thought of a hundred years ago. Um, previously, I'd mentioned that I had started to use a grocery pickup service prior to the pandemic. There are three grocery stores in my town, Walmart, Food Lion, and Save-A-Lot. And, you know, prior to the pandemic, I had been using Food Lion because they were a little bit smaller and it was easier for me to get around. But, you know, once the pandemic started, I was really, you know, scared about going out at all. And, you know, that anxiety or fear of going out has changed to more of a, a respect of, okay, I know this illness, COVID-19 is out there and I have to make sure I'm cautious. But at the very beginning, as we were learning more about it, you know, I was very, very nervous about going out, even just to do a pickup. And very quickly, um, Walmart instituted a delivery option. So, you know, I was probably one of the first to sign up for that because it was important to make sure that my children had what they needed, um, that I had meals that were quick and accessible, that, you know, I would be able to make you know, quickly because sometimes it takes me a lot longer than it used to. So, you know, just even 10 years ago for myself to think that I would be picking up my phone, going online and placing an order to have someone deliver groceries to me, you know, I just wouldn't have even thought that was necessary. But now, you know, it's an integral, I'm sorry, integral and core part of our lives, you know, where we live, um, it's very rural and other than, you know, maybe a couple pizza places, there were really no delivery services here. Um, I would get emails saying, you know, use Postmates or use, um, you know, Uber Eats, things like that, but there was nothing here. And even with the services that have started up, there are very limited options, but I'm just really, really thankful that we have them, um, even with some prescriptions um, the the um, pharmacy closest to where i live they don't offer what i would say traditional delivery but you know one time i was having a really bad day and i needed um, some of my medication that was sitting there at the pharmacy and when i checked they would have actually mailed it to me overnight and with no fee even though i know it would have cost them you know probably more than they were getting on the um, medication because it was a relatively inexpensive one but it was like okay they're really trying to make accommodations for people who can't get out or who have limited mobility now probably um, one of the biggest impacts that um, we're going to see is the workplace I think previously there was this hesitancy to move a lot of things into a work from home status. 
and you know previous to COVID-19 I worked one day a week from home but it really was necessary for me to be in the office most days of the week. Um, the thing was I would tire out very easily. It was a long drive. The building was very big and you know, near the end um, of when I was working in that building, there were a couple times I needed a wheelchair, which someone had to come and get me. I had the wheelchair and that was just very, I think it put more of a burden on my coworkers as well as I wasn't feeling the greatest either, which means I couldn't give everything I had to my job. But now in a very short period of time, a lot of these businesses needed to go into a work from home setting. So at least from the feedback I've heard from a lot of my friends, yes, they do miss social interaction, but having that option there is really, um, you know, it helps them balance their work home life by having that capability. So, you know, moving forward, things are still kind of fluid, but there have been guidelines set um, for those who do have disabilities about going back into work. I will um, link that information into either the description of the podcast or the description of the video. And just to circle back, whenever I do use a source, I will make sure that it's linked in um, the notes. But there have been guidelines set out um, for those who may have a disability about, okay, once we get past, you know, all of the waves of the pandemic, is it still necessary for that person to be in the office at all times? Could they do work from home? Would there be different accommodations? You know, that could help out really in the long run for keeping someone you know, able to work um, as long as it's not an unreasonable um, burden on the employer, which is some of the terminology that is currently used. You know, then, you know, that's something or an accommodation I think that should be looked at because it keeps people more productive and happier for a longer period of time. But, you know, again, looking back even 10 or 15 years ago to have this, for lack of a better term, this wholesale integration of people going from one day working in a building, working in an office to working from home and doing a lot of video conferencing. I think as a society, we were able to accomplish that rather quickly. And so hopefully going forward, you know, Businesses will be more open to those who are not customer facing to be able to work from home. It will keep the morale up, um, you know, and make people happier. And then especially if there is a situation where you know, someone may need a special accommodation, there's already been things put in motion that can help a person um, with that. Looking back at some other ways that technology has been used more recently, um, you know, there are different apps that we can use to help trace um, contact or interactions with those who may have COVID. I know on my cell phone, there was an app that I could download. And even though I didn't go out much, that technology was there to help me know if I may have come in contact with someone who was also using that same app. Um, that way I would have that information up front. Now it was a personal preference. You know, for example, my husband did not want to download the app and that's completely up to him. I wanted to have that information in case I did come in contact with someone. Um, just like he you know, doesn't do a lot of things on the computer because he doesn't want his information out there. You know, I personally do my typing. I'm doing a podcast. Um, you know, it's just different personal preferences. So that was a benefit for those who really wanted to interact in that manner so that they would know and have that information earlier rather than later. Unfortunately too though, with quick access to um, technology and interaction, 
there were a lot of pieces of misinformation out there. Um, I really felt that no matter what your beliefs were, there were a lot of people who were trying to change the narrative. So some people, you know, I heard this, you know, heard statistics where it said, oh, really only a handful of people died from COVID. There were, you know, thousands of other people who died because they had an underlying condition. Well, they would not have died if they did not get COVID. But that was kind of being formed to say that COVID was not really that bad. Um, I personally did not believe that. I was, you know, on the, you know, other side of the spectrum where I felt precautions needed to be taken, but also understanding that, you know, that was the position I was in, uh, but that I needed to respect that other people were not in the same position as I was, and they were entitled to their own opinion, but I wanted everybody, and I'm sure everybody else did too, to have the facts. But, you know, again, I really think that there were a lot of people who were trying to work things around to be more favorable to their beliefs. Um, I'm a very analytical person in a lot of ways. So I just really want the facts. And from those facts, I want to draw my own conclusions. So um, while that information was out there, we really had to be careful about what we were reading to make sure that we were getting the most accurate information. Now, this next part kind of goes into um, the misinformation and goes back to the reason why I did start this podcast. Um, I did some, ex I did experience some negative comments um, and I don't really respond to a lot of things online. Um, at least I didn't. In some ways, I, I might share a little bit more now. Um, you kind of, again, gaining my voice. But, you know, the social media, it brought about a way for us to be able to keep in touch with people that we weren't able to see face to face. Um, we were able to keep tabs on our friends, on our family. Um, but at the same time, we also encountered people that we may not know on a daily basis, you know, encountering people who might be friends of friends of friends who are all following the same thread and, you know, getting things said such as, you know, the loss of a few lives or your life is not worth, you know, all of these things shutting down. And, you know, I, that was the specific instance that I experienced. Um, you know, in case you haven't um, listened to the previous podcasts, but, you know, trying to be respectful of the fact that the person who said that probably was experiencing severe economic distress or, you know, at least some financial impact from that, you know, even trying to remain respectful, it didn't mean that everybody else is gonna be respectful back. So unfortunately, where we can sometimes see the best in people when there's an emergency or crisis, sometimes you can see the worst in people. And while I was sorry that, you know, whether it was myself or anybody else who was seeing comments like that, that should not have been made, you know, at least I knew I'm not going to go near that person as far as comments. I'm just going to leave them alone. I knew where to fight my battles and that was not worth, you know, personally um, getting into like a social media um, blitz or war with this person. I just ignored it from that point on. So we all have to have our own certain ways of handling things like that. So, you know, as with a lot of things that I've learned throughout life, not just with COVID, um, you know, everybody has their own perspectives and you're not always going to please everyone or everyone's not going to like you. Um, it was the same before COVID. It will be the same after COVID. It's just, you know, learning how to approach those 
people in those situations in the best way that you can. I apologize. I had to stop for a few minutes. Um, my husband came in with the cat. Um, so if I repeat just a little bit, I apologize. Um, but you know, even though, you know, I had some negative experiences with social media, again, I know it's not all bad. So, um, you know, I do want to do some episodes about how technology helped keep us in touch during this, um, and how it helped our mental health to be able to reach out to someone, you know, and also looking at some of the advances that as a society we've made to help address mental health where, you know, before it used to be completely taboo to discuss. Whereas, you know, now I'm glad that people are discussing it more openly because it is an important part of our health. It is, you know, they, they play hand in hand, all parts of our health, emotional, physical, and mental. So, you know, just some of the advances we've made either in technology, in allowing, um, you know, remote sessions with a therapist, and also knowing that even just a few years ago when I was, you know, working with a therapist over the phone, I was really very limited because a lot of insurance plans wouldn't cover that. But now I think there's more of an openness to that. So that's a good evolution of the way technology is working there. Now, just looking at this as a whole of technology as a whole, we still have to continue to address the questions of, you know, equity and being able to access the things that we need whether it's access to Wi-Fi, making sure that you know, people have compatible devices, whether it's you know, just the financial burdens that do come along with having technology. It, you know, it's unfortunately not something that people can, you know, at the snap of their fingers, just be able to say, you know what, I can support three more people in the house who are normally at work or at school being on the internet all day, um, whether it's for work or school, um, whether it's long term or short term, you know, I've seen my electric bill increase dramatically. And though it's not all due to, you know, virtual schooling and things like that, it is having someone in the house all day, um, where normally there wasn't. So those types of factors need to be looked at as well. And also locations, you know, um, just not everybody lives in a location where they have access to, um, whether it be internet or, you know, different health options. Um, like I know for the telehealth visits I've had, even though it's done over the phone or by video, it has to be done with a doctor who's licensed in the state that I'm in. So... You know, if you don't find someone who fits your exact needs, that can be difficult as well. You know, if they're not in the same state or depending on what the limitations are with your insurance or, you know, laws of the state. We'll also need to continue to keep in mind other aspects of technology in the workplace. Um, your concerns that I have would be if businesses are finding that they can work more with automation or with fewer people working on site, is that going to make the job market decrease? So there's just so many things that you know go into the advancements that we've made where some of them are related directly to you know, those with a disability or a rare illness where others are you know, just all around facing society. But when something faces society, usually if you're someone who has a disability, who has a chronic illness, those challenges just become twofold or even more. You, know, you have to face your normal day-to-day -day challenges such as you know, whether it be mobility, um, your chronic pain, anything like that, you're already facing those obstacles and then having to face you know, these 
challenges that are being put in front of us again, um, whether it's fighting for positions in the workplace or you know trying to keep our position when, as we've seen, a lot of things are going to automation and making sure that we're being treated fairly as well. So this is where I'm going to end my last episode specifically about comparisons and the use of technology um, you know, once we got to the current pandemic. Um, I am going to be looking into you know, ways that social media and technology has helped our mental health. Like I said, um, also the reliance that we've come to have on technology, looking at the pros and cons, what happens if that technology fails when we need it, especially as it pertains to our health. And there's so many different aspects on that. Now, I've still not heard back from someone I emailed a couple of weeks ago who had um, wrote some articles about um, different apps. I should say one article, but she um, had a number of different apps um, that she discussed in the article. Um, you know, so I was hoping to get some feedback on that and possibly do an interview, but I you know, haven't been able to contact her. Um, you know, mainly that email went through the site itself to get to that person. So, you know, it's basically sending it and hoping it gets to the right person. So someone wanted to come and make a guest appearance. This is Munchie and he lives up to his name. He will eat about anything. He's eaten through, um, a couple of box springs, the bottom of the couch, the love seat, and the chair in our living room. He's gotten trapped a couple times. We had to take the bottoms off um, to get him out. But having a pet is really, really great, especially right now. Um, he is definitely my little buddy. As he's trying to bite me, I think, or. He's just trying to lick me. So this is my, my little baby. Um, and if you're listening to the podcast and don't get to see him, he's this, um, I think he's a ragdoll mix. I think he has part ragdoll in him. So, oop. so he has a little bit of a longer hair um, and has some of the markings, but it's not quite as long as a traditional um, rag doll. So I think he's a mix and he wanted to get down now. Um, <laughs> but yeah, he's been great to have around. He's, you know, I sometimes have conversations directly with him, but, um, getting back to, um, upcoming episodes. So those are things that probably will take longer to research. So I'll be looking at, you know, possibly shorter topics over the next couple of weeks. Um, now someone that I do have set up to do an interview at some point, I know she just had surgery actually. So, um, I'll be looking at that, you know, probably a little bit later then. Um, plus still trying to learn to work with the technology I have here, um, <laughs> to, to make sure that I can record everything simultaneously. So, um, you know, hopefully things will start getting back to normal soon. I know that I would appreciate that. Um, and if I have any, actually by the time next week that I do see my immunologist, the next episode should probably already be posted. So I'll give an update in a couple weeks from of how that went. Um, and hopefully you know, I'll be able to get the vaccine soon to try to start being a little bit normal or more normal um, even though, you know, for right now, I know we keep hearing the words, the new normal, but you know, that's how it is right now. Um, but fingers crossed, I'll be able to get that soon. Um, again, I really appreciate everybody tuning in to listen. If you do get a chance, please share the podcast. Um, now I'm, I'm not really sure how all the numbers work and how they do that. 
Um, but I know more, the more listens that it has, I think it comes up higher in searches. And um, also if there's any ratings given, I believe it does the same thing. Um, I really am looking for topics as well. So if there's anything anybody would like to look into or, you know, wants to email me, I'll have all my contact in the notes. I have a Twitter, um, Facebook page, my direct email, um, all of those things. So if you just want to share some ideas, please feel free to reach out. Um, you know, if you continue to listen, you'll hear this dozens and dozens and dozens of times that I really want to respect everybody's differences in the situations and knowing that everybody has different needs. And you know, so I really want to make sure that everybody's represented as well as, um, you know, kind of a saying that I have is that if everybody were exactly the same, the world would be a very boring place. So I want to be able to appreciate everybody's concerns, everybody's experiences, um, and again, their situations. So if you just have any ideas um, that you might like discuss, just you know, please send me an email or drop me a message and I will get back to you as soon as I can. Um, thank you again for tuning in and I will talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Come on, Munchie.